Hi, and welcome to Mrs. Pam Reads. Today we are continuing in our story, Zoo, by James Patterson and Michael Ledwich. We wrapped up book one in the last video, and Oz had basically in the last one um, been traveling by air to Botswana. And so now he's there. So book two is entitled Into Africa. And we're going to start in chapter 13. My first glimpse of Africa 12 hours later was actually sort of a letdown. Johannesburg, beyond the massive windows of the airport, was just a bunch of nondescript buildings. It could have been Cleveland. An hour later, when we took off northbound for Botswana, my mood lifted considerably. The green and tan expanse of seemingly endless landscape looked the way the little kid in me wanted Africa to look, hot, wild, secluded. As we were beginning our final descent into Mon, I saw there were some modern buildings, but most of the structures were cinder block and tin. Coming down the steps onto the tarmac, I saw that beyond the flimsy chain link fence along the airport's perimeter, there were donkeys everywhere. There were also rendezvous and traditional African thatch-roofed round huts built of stone and cow dung. The feel of the place, the heat, the Swedish smell of manure and diesel, even the sharp blinding yellow light was pleasantly strange. After I made it through customs, Abraham Bindix took off his tattered straw hat and greeted me with a bear hug inside the rundown terminal. Abraham was a boiler tank of a man. Broad-shouldered and blocky, the 50-ish weather-beaten man reminded me a sun belt reminded me a I think there's a typo there. I think it should have said reminded me of a <laughs> Sun Belt College football coach. His face was as hard and creased as an old work glove with a mustache fading into the scruff of his cheeks. A shag carpet of chest hair burst from the unbuttoned neck of his sweat dampened linen shirt. Some faded blue tattoos on the furry wine barrels he called his arms were reminders of his Navy days. It was good to see his loopy, gap-toothed smile. The last time I'd seen him was in Paris. We'd sat at the hotel bar and gotten drunk as swine after I'd been booed off the convention stage. He seemed heavier than I remembered him in Paris. He also seemed noticeably older, a little slower on his feet. I wondered if he was ill. Thank you for coming, my friend, but I have bad news, he said as I scooped up my bags from the pile of luggage beside the plane. I liked Abraham, but took him with a grain of salt. Like a lot of Africaners, he was crude as oil and casually racist in a way that can make a white American dude a touch uncomfortable. Still, there was something almost grandfatherly about him, something Papa Bear. Unfortunately, a problem has arisen, he said, a family thing. Is it possible for you to wait a day before I can take you up to the village near Zimbabwe? Of course. What's up, Abe? Can I help? I said, no, no, it's a family thing, he said. Abe had a warm, brassy honk of a voice, like a muted trumpet. My little brother, Philip, the pacifist, is the manager at a game spotting lodge over in the bush near the Namibian border, Namibia, oh, sorry. 
I take rich American tourists out to kill animals, but he takes them out just to look at them, take pictures. Lions, actually, two huge prides of them that eat the Cape Buffalo up there in the Acavango Delta. I'm sorry if I'm massacring the city names. What's the problem? Don't know, man. His lodge has been out of radio contact over 24 hours, and me mum is worried. It is probably nothing with all the craziness going on. I need to make sure the wanker is okay. <laughs> so let's head out, I said. You said the lodge has lions, right? Lions are what I came 8,000 miles to see. My enthusiasm seemed to brighten Abe's spirit. Right, man, he said, slapping my shoulder. It hurt a little. I knew you were a friend, Oz. I tried to get my trackers to come with me, but the superstitious boogies are still completely spooked by the slaughtered village we came across. The pagan bastards said they wanted nothing to do with lions until, quote, the spirits are calmer, unquote. Uncalm spirits. Lions? I thought about my sinking feeling on the plane, the feeling of God's wrath in the air. Then I dismissed it. I wadded up my uneasiness and tossed it over my shoulder. Which way to Akavango? I said, hefting my camera case. Chapter 14. I think the light is, I'm sorry, I keep having issues with this light, but it's getting my glasses, making it a little annoying. Is that may be better. Okay. Uh, so chapter 14. No, depends on where I put my face. <laughs> Instead of heading out of the airport, Abe and I walked south inside the terminal and made a right into a narrow, dingy corridor. What are we doing? I thought we were going to your brother's lodge, I said. Right, man, we are. In the northern delta, there are no roads, only airstrips, Abe explained. Walking, he dug a tin of chewing tobacco out of one of the pockets of his khaki utility vest, scooped some of it into his fingers, and put a wad under his lip. We need to rent a plane. Rent a plane, I said. I hope you know how to fly one, because I only know how to jump out of them. That skill might come in handy. Abe said. His jaw was working, moistening the chew. He winked. I have a license, but I have not flown in some time. We went through a door and walked right back out onto the tarmac beside the plane I just exited. I noticed they were a little more lax with security here on the dark continent. No one even asked me to take off my shoes. We turned a corner into a hangar. A half-black, half-Asian man in a greasy fedora sat beside a desk eating some kind of barbecued meat with his fingers. Another African who looked like a soldier or policeman, judging by his soiled gray uniform and gray beret, sat next to him and wore a flat black AK-47 over his shoulder. They both had their feet up and were watching a movie on a portable DVD player. I peeked over the policeman's shoulder. It was Happy Gilmore, an Adam Sandler movie. They were, they weren't, they weren't laughing. Granted, it wasn't very funny, but they didn't seem to get that it was a comedy. Oh, interesting. Abe spent about 10 minutes bellowing like a bull at the two of them in a language I soon learned was Setswana. In the end, Abraham, his face sweaty, red, and puffy with heat, fished around in the pouches of his utility vest and handed the guy at the desk a folded wad of bills. The man thumbed through them with hands that were still sticky from the meat he'd been eating, seemed satisfied and directed us outside with a mafia's tough chin jerk that he probably learned from American movies. 
We walked outside and down a lane between two rows of small bush planes. Abe threw open the door of a rust flaked red and white Piper Super Cub that had cartoonishly oversized Tundra tires and squeezed my bags behind the seats. Wait here, man, he said. I'll be right back. Abe went back into the hangar. When he returned a moment later, he was coming from the other end of the airport, riding in a battered Range Rover. Two dogs, sleek, red-brown Rhodesian Ridgebacks, tumbled out when he opened the door. They hopped into the plane as though they'd done so many times before. Then Abe heaved two large gun cases from the truck and packed them into the plane as well. He caught me looking at the guns. Better to have and not need than need and not have, right, ma'am? He said, giving my cheek an avuncular pinch. Soon, my ears were nestled in squishy radio headphones, and we were taxiing onto the runway, one on the other side of the airport's dusty service road, I spotted a fenced field that had stones and strange striped tents in it. What's that, Abe? I shouted over the gathering roar of propeller choppers, pointing. That's a graveyard, Abe shouted back. He opened the plane's throttle and we began bouncing down the tarmac. So many dead from AIDS around here, they cannot dig fast enough. So they pile up the coffins under tents. What's the American joke about cemeteries? People are dying to get in, I offered. Right, ma'am, that's the one. Abe gave me a sardonic smile. His teeth were jumbly crooked and tobacco stained. He pulled back the throttle and our tiny plane left terra firma. Welcome to Africa, man. Chapter 15. Even with my jet lag, the claustrophobic confinement of the plane and a dog panting fragrantly in each ear, that 30 minute plane ride was, all, was the most exhilarating of my life. Flying over the Okavango Delta was like going back in time. I, sorry, I'm looking at how far we have to ghost him. Speaking of time, I half expected to see dinosaurs walking around below us. There wasn't a single building, not a house or even a rendezvous on the endless brown plain rippling along beneath us. I watched the shadow of the aircraft glide over white islands dotted between clear blue ribbons of water. On them were palm trees and giant lumps of earth that Abe told me were termite mounds. Now that it was July, one of the winter months, Abe explained, the delta dried up and swelled to three times its normal size, attracting one of the greatest concentrations of wildlife on the planet. We flew over hippos, hyenas, a herd of massive Cape buffalo, horned and black, which Abe told me were considered by some professional hunters to be more dangerous than lions. There were river birds, seemingly in the millions, scattering from the dry marshes at the sound of our plane. The first humans we saw were a couple of African fishermen in a hand-cut dugout. Who needs the Discovery Channel, I thought. This is it, Abe said a few minutes later, his voice crackling over my headphones. <clears throat> we lowered our speed and altitude as we banked down towards some thatched roofs beside the faint white scar of an airstrip. I was expecting the landing to be bump as bumpy as the takeoff. So I was surprised when Abe laid the piper down as smooth as silk. I pulled off my headphones and in the wake of the noise, the silence was almost ghostly. My ears rang a bit. This is funny, Abe said as we climbed out of the plane and into the, into the heat. 
not funny ha ha. What? I said. The staff. When they see a plane landing, they are usually waiting here, clapping, singing their silly folk songs, and holding a stiff drink and a hot towel. I do not see or hear anything. Do you? Not even any animals. He was right. The only sound was the thrumming drone of insects under the glaring sun. The thatch roofed buildings in the distance, which we could see at the end of a dusty path lined with brittle brown reeds and papayas, papayas all seemed empty, deserted. A silvery band of light shimmered on the horizon, vague, shaking with heat. Abe whistled, and the two sleek dogs broke into a trot, scouting ahead, heads scanning, their sense of smell going into overdrive. The camp we followed them into was as bustling as a graveyard. We searched all six platform tents, along with the dining area. We found clothes, luggage, safari gear, tourist stuff, pit helmets, and khaki utility vests open port mantuous spewing socks and underwear onto unmade beds. No tourists, no staff. There was what looked like a shipping container, a giant red box of corrugated metal behind the kitchen. Alongside it, we found a Land Rover with two extra rows of raised seats to accommodate wildlife watchers. Abe half coughed and half cursed in a language I didn't recognize. He spat out a jet of brown tobacco juice into the grass and wiped his mouth with his shirt. Two of the trucks are missing. Besides, the guides, there are another half dozen maids and cooks. This is very strange, Oz. Where the devil is everyone? Where is my little brother? I have a bad feeling. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. Abe put his fingers to his lips and pierced the air with a whistle, and the dogs came running. He hopped into the rover, found the keys, and started the engine. After we drove back to the plane and retrieved his rifles, we drove north from the camp over a badly rutted car path. Pebbles popped and crunched under the tires, and the car rattled and shuttled over the washboard-like waves on the road. When the car path petered out, we hit an even bumpier field of tall, dry grass. Around a stand of ebony trees, some baby hyenas were wading in the shallow river water, fat gloves of reeking mud on their paws. I couldn't help but gawk as though I were on safari. But if Abe noticed them, or the family of giraffes drinking in the shallows a hundred feet south of them downriver, he didn't say anything. We were steering around a stand of fig trees when we finally saw people. A group of Africans stood milling around by a dock at the river's edge. It was two men and a pudgy boy all in chef's whites, and they were preparing to get into some dugouts. Abe pulled hard on the wheel, piloted the rover over to the men, and brought it to a jerky stop. He shouted something quick at them in Setswana. The men yelled something back. They seemed to be arguing. The conversation took a few minutes. At the end of it, the three kitchen workers reluctantly got out of the canoe and climbed into the back of the car. I turned around and looked at them. Their faces were stolid, stolid? And blank, hard to read. They didn't acknowledge me. What's the story? I said to Abe as we pulled away. Abe tucked another pinch of tobacco into his cheek. It's worse than I thought, man. Two groups went out day before yesterday, 20 people, including my brother. Haven't heard from them since. Not only that, they said lions were actually in the camp last night. 
roaming around like stray kittens, picking at scraps. These bozos back there hid themselves in the shipping container. When they woke up, the radio transmitter had been broken, smashed somehow. Just now, they were going to try to go downstream to get help. Why were they arguing? Or why were you arguing? Abe took off his straw hat and wiped sweat off his sunburned brow. Abe perspired like a leaky faucet. I told them to come with us to help find the tourists and guides, but like my trackers, they're terrified. They said something is wrong with the lions, the same superstitious boogie shit. The gods are angry. There's black magic about booga, booga, booga. Behind us, the cooks started singing some sort of chant. Ah, there they go, said Abe, jerking a thumb over his shoulder at them. And they're singing some words, which I'll spare you. <laughs> Abe stopped the break and brought the rover to a sudden stop. He hopped out, went into his bag in the back, and took out one of the hunting rifles. It was a Winchester Model 70, bored for a massive 458 cartridge. He loaded the magazine with a huge brass shells and, it, and slapped it home with a clack. He climbed up into the back, maneuvering around the men, bags, and dogs, and strapped it to the truck's gun rack. You bozos want black magic? I'll show you some black magic. He called back at them as he revved the engine and threw the truck into gear. And we're going to stop there. Ha! Huh. Interesting. All right. I have a feeling that eventually um, the scene that we're probably going to run into is going to become gory. And I may kind of skip over some of that or parts of it or whatever. Because but. <laughs> but at the moment um things are okay everybody's fine oz is good abraham's good and uh they're gonna go find his brother all right you guys thank you for joining me um please remember if you have not yet to subscribe to the channel because if you click that bell tab then you'll get um, a notification as soon as a new video is posted and you'll know when the next one is coming and so you'll find out what happens. <laughs> All right, you guys, I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time.